filming. Can you introduce us to the philosophy and legacy of the encampment for citizenship? Now, I've tried <clears throat> to reduce the origin, the mission, the 60-some years of history of the uh, encampment for citizenship and something about what happens to the youth who go to it, what, what they end up doing and so forth. And much of that appears in my own, in my, in my own memoir, Scalloway, A White Southerner's Journey Through Segregation to Human Rights Activism by Edward H. Peebles. <laughs> and uh, channel, uh, chapter 8 covers uh, sort of the boot camp. I call it the boot camp for the encampment for citizenship. <clears throat> uh, because that's, I was 22 years old and I went to the encampment in New York. Met Eleanor Roosevelt and Martin Luther King. And I had just written Martin Luther King a letter and he wrote me back. That letter is in the VCU library. Uh, and it, what happened to me there is what you see today at that encampment. Uh, or what you, uh, may read about me in this book and other sources where. Now, uh, the encampment experience in Kentucky is covered in chapter 15, and it's called Communist Sex Fiends and Half-Breeds Take the Struggle to Appalachia. That's what they called us when we were there because we had a mixed racial and uh, ethnic uh, population. And uh, Knox County didn't warm up to it. Actually, it was the city fathers in Barberville that didn't warm up to it. People out in the rural area were welcomed our kids because they did work for them, out and did uh, service for them, out and made friends and uh, resulting in uh, letters of appreciation after I went back to Lexington from Knox County uh, in the fall. Uh, so, uh, but that was, uh, that chapter covers the tumultuous time we had with racial violence and intimidation and uh, one of the major complaints of the people in Barbara Will was that we had interracial ice cream licking, uh, which you know is a notorious offense against racial integrity. Uh, also, chapter 16 is an account of my confrontation with, uh, real, uh, with the Baron of Basketball. Adolf Rupp, and also follows up with what we graduate students and medical students organize to try to desegregate the Wildcats, mm -hmm. unsuccessfully I might say. And so that the book has these stories and, uh, and the, uh, when I got phone calls that threatened to, to blow up our, our room at Union College there. Uh, I called the FBI and like other times I'd call the FBI, they said they just collected information. They didn't have any jurisdiction. The state police uh, said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And of course the uh, sheriff's office and the town police wouldn't even answer our calls. They got in the habit of just ignoring us. Mm -hmm. Um, so the encampment had, uh, has had remarkable graduates. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, the congresswoman from Washington, D.C., was in my encampment in 57, and you may have seen her on television this past week at the hearing. She was uh, hearing on, uh, uh, about the FBI. Uh, but two 
two fellows, a lot of, a lot of accomplished kids came out of the 1966 in Kentucky encampment, which was in Knox County. Uh, two of them, uh, I would, I would uh, share with you that two of them uh, are especially notable. Miles Rappaport was 16 years old and uh, became, went on later on, decades later, to become the president of Demos. Demos is a a very well-known research and think tank for progressive ideas and their papers uh, help lots of people deal with uh, with things. You may see their now present president on TV oftentimes uh, sharing what what they've learned. Uh, Peter Neufeld was, is, uh, was 16 years old also, also in that group. And he went on uh, to be a co-founder of the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project was a uh, was a idea of trying to keep people out of prison that had been unfairly uh, put in prison because they didn't uh, because they were innocent. Mm -hmm. And it caught on as a movement, and you'll find an Innocence Project in every state in America now. And this is a this is a sixteen year old boy who I had to discipline for drinking uh, up up in the mountains and drinking un, uh, illegal liquor. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to because he was only sixteen, and uh, they were stressing the uh, testing the limits. So the priceless lessons learned at the encampment have been repeated for well uh, since 1946 when the first one started. And this over, there were over 11,000 alums who went through and my, our guess is there's 7,000 still living. Mm -hmm. But many, among many of them were, uh, some served in President Kennedy's White House. Uh, and and uh, others did other distinctive things in, in the arts, in politics, in, uh, in a host of other places. Uh, so these are perfect examples of what the encampment can do for us. And because the encampment experience takes place in something of a constructed, idyllic, democratic community, community, its lessons and the images of diversity are embedded in their memory forever and they discover because of the camaraderie, camaraderie that rises over, over uh, race, ethnicity, and other social demarcations. It, it, uh, they feel like they're never alone, even if they're the only person on the scene of practicing justice. And so uh, what I've seen is in my nearly 70 years of being associated with the encampment as uh, in lots of different ways. I was a director of the summer encampment. I was a fundraiser. I've been done lots of different things for it. And uh, I've been a speaker at many of them. Uh, the thing I've seen is that uh, we have built an army of people who are working on this, uh, on working on justice. And, uh, and the, the uh, 17 and 18 year olds that are graduating now are already becoming activists in their community. And they, some of them haven't finished high school. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm.